time? Yeah. All right, let's start. Um, so I'm obviously not Ross Burton. Um, if you came here to see Ross, I'm sorry he's not here, but I am. He has a better accent, but I'm way funnier. Um, my name is Beth Flanagan. I am the release engineer for the Octo Project. Um, I'm also a software developer for Intel OTC. I'm a contributor to OECore and the Octo Project. Mainly deal with license wrangling, build statistics, GPL compliance tools. Uh, I've also written uh, documentation for BitBake for a book uh, called The Architecture of Open Source Applications, Volume 2. Um, but what I'm here to talk to you about is my first love, which is auto builders. I love auto builders. I started with auto builders in about 2006, uh, working for a feature animation company whose name shall uh, not be spoken. If you buy me drinks, I will tell you how someone screwed me out of a movie credit. Um, then I went on to uh, work for smart meter or for the local electric company doing smart meter infrastructure auto builders. So if you live in Portland and the electricity goes out, totally my fault. Um, I now am the maintainer of the Octo Auto Builder project, or the Octo Project Auto Builder. So one of the things that I'm going to introduce today is some of the refactoring work that has been done in the Octo Auto Builder. So there's some caveats here. This is brand new code. Not quite feature complete, but it's totally functional. In other words, it works on my machine. Uh, it's stable. In other words, it hasn't crashed on my machine. Um, and really, it does need more eyes on it because I'm running into issues where I have no idea why it doesn't work on uh, Saul Wold's weird configuration that he has. <coughs> this is literally brand new code within the last two months. So the interfaces and configs to this shouldn't change. They may have something really bad is found. If they do, all of this should be backwards compatible. Um, it's also entirely untested in a production environment, and we're going to talk about some of the plans that the Octo Project has for implementation on this, as well as testing. So why, other than Ross Burton's not here, do we talk about auto builders at an embedded conference? Um, and really what this comes down is to, to this whole code compile test loop. You know, an application developer, their code compile test loop is like 15 minutes at max. Um, maybe if they're like playing dangerous or like 30 minutes. For an operating system engineer, your code compile test loop may be anywhere from 20 minutes, 15 minutes to hours. If you start hacking around with eglibc and you have to recompile a whole bunch more uh, root FSs, you may be looking at six hours there. So one of the things that's a really nice fit thing to do is continuous integration when it comes to embedded. Have someone else deal, deal with building it and you keep on going on your merry way. The other reason is that auto builders should release software. Um, I'm a software developer, but I'm also a release engineer. And I like doing release engineering, um, mainly because uh, a few years ago I started doing this because the release documentation sucked. It was horrible. It was all wrong. And really your release process should be in code. Let the auto builder do it. Your, release pro your re documented release process should be push this button. Make your release processes push button. So a little bit of history behind the Octo Auto Builder. It was originally called the Pocky Auto Builder. Uh, Richard Purdy created it in 2009. The initial config was about 177 lines, had four targets. Um, somewhere in between 2009 and 2010, Scott Garman took it over. Um, if you went to Scott's talk yesterday about uh, the menu board, Scott did excellent work on this. Uh, it was 642 lines, 17 targets. Uh, took around 26 hours to build nightly, which wasn't precisely nightly, but it did it only on three machines, two machines. Um, so it was a fairly, fairly tight situation. I joined the Octo Project in November 2010, and then this slowly and rapidly, well, slowly and rapidly, depending on how you, how you look at it, grew very, very quickly. Uh, there were, there's been a lot of improvements to the Auto Builder over the past two and a half years. Some of these have been feature-driven. Um, the uh, introduction to OE Core has been one of the major features. Um, 
shared state, uh, auto builder using shared state, and having a cluster of auto builders all using the same, same shared state has actually kind of improved our uh, build times. <coughs> um, when you have, and at one point, we started looking at build times at 42 hours for a nightly. Um, the solution to this was throw more hardware at it, and one of the gentlemen who worked on this, Michael Hall, said sitting right out front. Um, so we started seeing a lot of improvements on this. So the current state of things has a lot of good about it. All this work reduced build time significantly. We are now looking at, on average, six and a half hours of build time to generate a quarter terabyte worth of build artifacts. Images, ABT repos, Eclipse plugin, uh, the build appliance VM. Uh, and this doesn't even include like shared state, DLDR, all those other things. What this uh, allows us to do is do very quick turnaround. We notice that something got committed to master and it starts breaking things. We can go and fix that quicker than having to sit there and wait 24 hours. And again, this, uh, the, the current uh, incarnation of the Octo Auto Builder supports a lot of very cool features. Uh, shared state there on an ass, so all the builders can use it. Uh, build history, sanity testing, persist DB reuse. All of this got put in in the past two and a half years, but the unfortunate thing is it's caused some bad things. One of these bad things has to do with, just out of curiosity, who has experience with BuildBot here other than me? All right, two people. Part of this has to do with how BuildBot does conditional build steps. If, if you're a normal developer, you're used to a conditional being if then else. BuildBot likes saying, well, no, this conditional build step is run this function. If it returns true, then the condition's true. Run the build step. If it's not, run it false. And then what you end up doing is starting to get a very large config file that ends up getting code and config mixed together. And it's icky. Uh, it's not so bad for build engineers like me who don't mind hacking through this, but for the rest of you, it sucks. Uh, so by late 20, uh, 2011, or 2012, sorry, the auto builder main config was 2,714 lines long. And we started getting into the situation where if I got hit by the lottery bus, uh, won the lottery or got hit by the bus, then we would have a situation where no one could take this over. Um, I started noticing that this was getting to be a problem. Um, but then there was the ugly. This is one of my favorite quotes. I, I love this quote, and you know I like the picture of uh, Winston Churchill up there. Criticism may not be agreeable, but it is necessary Still the same function as pain in the human body. It calls attention to the unhealthy state of things. Prior to 1.3, there was a beta test. <coughs> and that beta test called attention to the unhealthy state of things. Um, the, mainly around people setting up and reusing the Octo Auto Builder. Other people were having a hard time reusing it. Uh, it required advanced knowledge of BuildBot required knowledge of how things were structured within the Octo Auto Builder config and understanding just the concept behind the Auto Builder. And none of this came as a surprise to me. I had been yelling about it for about nine months. I just didn't have time to fix it. And really what it came down to was a philosophical change that I needed to look at. The initial Auto Builder, like a lot of CI systems, came out of a need. There was a need to just run this and build, run this and build. And then it moved into this reference design. Well, here's how you set this up. And now it has to move into something that's a usable product for people who utilize the Octo project to actually take and reuse. But the question is, how do you do this and give end users rope, but not enough rope that they hang themselves with it? And the other question is, the Octo Auto Builder does the one thing that it was designed to do, release the Octo project releases, and it does it very well. But how do I do that and enable people, lots of other people, to do their things very well? So 
sometime after 1.3, I sat down and I looked at, the, at some of the user feedback and I said, all right, these criticisms really have to drive my goals for the next version of this. I have to make it so that people can set up their own auto builders very easy. I want to require very limited knowledge of Python. Nothing very special, just very basic knowledge of Python. Very limited knowledge of BuildBot, even. Wanted to provide good code references and good config references. <coughs> one of the main pain points is code goes one place, configuration stuff goes to an entirely different place. They should never meet. And I wanted to add some very new, some new much begged for features. Um, there had been people who had been begging for some of these features, like mix and match repos, which I'll go into in a little bit. Um, but there was no really good way to do this in the old architecture without ripping things apart. I also needed to maintain all the old features that I had put in over the past two and a half years. Um, in doing all of this, if people want to do really hard things, like have their little lava lamp that turns red if things go fail, I want to enable them to, do, to still be able to do those hard things. And in the end, what the new auto builder spits out is it has to be, has to be the same thing that the old auto builder spits out. <coughs> so the one lesson I learned out of this is the best time to do a proof of concept is when no one is looking. My manager's sitting right there and he's probably, uh, yeah, he's shaking his head, good. Um, for the uh, first day of Christmas break, I was, got bored. Uh, and I said, all right, I'm going to start looking at this. Um, so Christmas break started like December 19th and I don't think I really slept until like December 24th. Uh, woke up Christmas day, started writing code. By December 26th we had actually something that started working. Something that could actually spit out images. It wasn't pretty, but it worked. So what I want to do is I want to introduce some of the architectural overview of what we're doing here. Um, I have the, this is a contextual joke. If you were at FOSDEM and saw the System D talk, uh, System D is an init system, System D is a platform. Uh, the Octo Auto Builder is a continuous integration system, but it's also an abstraction layer over Bit or BuildBot. <coughs> we split out code from core, co from core code and build step. So we have the core auto builder code and then build step code. We also split out config from all that code as well. And this provides an interface to be able to use custom build steps as well as build bot build steps. So there's three types of config files that we're using. First one's autobuilder.com. And has anyone actually used the old auto builder other than me? Oh, good. Um, autobuilder.conf is the, basically the global settings file. What this says is where does the autobuilder spit out its DL there? Where does it spit out shared state? Do we want to collect build history? Basically, all these things that every builder on the autobuilder needs to know, or every build set on the autobuilder needs to know about. This lives in the config directory that's going to be changing. The main build set or uh, config file for the Octo Auto Builder is the Octo AB config. Technically, this is the only config file you need. That's not a good idea. I'll show you why in a little bit. This also lives in config. What I end up doing is taking build, st build sets. So nightly, nightly x86, nightly x80, or nightly arm, and putting their, them in their own config files. You take them in the config, or you put them in a config file, you drop it in the config directory, you start up the auto builder, auto builder knows about it. So when we look at the main Yocto auto builder config file, it has one top level section and that's it. That top level section is the only thing that technically needs to exist. You can start the Yocto auto builder up with it. It won't build anything, but you can do it. It's the only thing that actually needs to be there. And it only has one property, and that's order. 
Uh, order dictates on the waterfall page what order you see things in. This is the, one of the few places that I've actually modified BuildBot, and I'm working on the patch that I did to see if this can get upstreamed. And I am going to show you what the actual file looks like. This is the file that we have right now. And like I said, one property, order. And if you go and look at the Octo Auto Builder, the one I have running on this local machine, you can see that it's in the exact order. But all the way at the end here, we have these builders that aren't actually listed. Or, no, they are listed. Um, let's assume that they weren't listed in the Octo or in that or order property. Sorry about that. What happens then is that the auto that billbot will just revert to its own sort order this was one of those things because we like seeing nightly all the way on the left hand side it's kind of silly but we do the next thing that we have are the config files that actually control build sets these only have four properties with four properties, you can run an entire build. Steps, properties, repos, and builders. Only three of these are actually required. That would be steps, property, or steps, repos, and builders. I'm going to take the easy one first, which is builders. Builders just tell you where that build set runs. So if you have a distributed build system, builder one, builder two, builder three, and you want that to only run on certain one of those builders, you just create a, a list of those builders and assign it that. The repos are a list of repos needed for a particular build set. So for example, Pocky.get, Meta Intel, Meta QT3, etc. <coughs> if you look down in the bottom, this is what the repo section looks like. It's fairly straightforward, it needs the name of the repo needs the repo URL, BB priority, and branch. BB priority is actually at this point optional. And in fact, it doesn't work yet. I haven't implemented that yet. Um, you don't even need branch. You can name this hash or tag. Uh, I have that in there for convenience because some people can't grok the concept that hash, branch, tag are all the same thing. <coughs> One of the interesting things here, and I'm going to show you this, is that if we look at Nightly, Nightly has only three repos defined. But way down here, and I'm going to talk about triggering builds in a little bit, Nightly is a worker build set. What Nightly does, does is Nightly goes and says, run this, and then go run all these, these guys over here. But one of the things that I needed to do I need to be able to set Nightly's repository, its branch, tag, or hash, as well as every triggered build step that it ends up triggering. And the reason for this is, let's say I want to build master on everything except this person has, a, has something in their contrib branch that I want to pull in for nightly multi-lib. I can actually go into nightly multi-lib and set Pocky contrib and well, we'll do SGW mut because I do SGW mut quite a bit. And it will tell nightly multi-lib to run that, to ignore everything else. What this, the main reason for this is, and we'll go through this in a later slide, this gets me out of dictating branching policy for people. The other thing that we have are properties. Properties are uh, things that you can add to pass on to build steps. It is one of the few places that you need actual BuildBot knowledge. And there's a section in the BuildBot documentation that talks about scheduler properties. Most people will never touch these. 
I actually need to touch these because we have uh, a build target called build appliance and build appliance needs to sometimes run with the build appliance source rev set to auto rev and sometimes set to not auto rev. So I need to actually switch this from time to time. The old way of doing it was going into uh, the repository and changing the source rev hash. Um, the easy way of doing it is this. One of the cool things that, it, and, and I, I'm kind of understating the power of this, because one of the cool things, and this is probably a poorly named target here, is that you can actually sit there and start hacking that force build page to force it to do things like, well, email this alert when complete, or email me when this is complete. So type in an email address. And I have a special build step in the background. I want to build Adam PC. I want to build this with core image LSB. So you can start doing really cool things with this. And you do it all through a config file. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you that config file right now. This section right here is all that's needed for that. Now, for it to get it, do anything on the back end, you do need to create a custom build step. And then the last thing is the thing that does the heavy lifting. It's the last property and step. The Octo Auto Builder provides very basic general build steps uh, that we utilize. <coughs> These are generally um, taking, taking BuildBot build steps and subclassing them out and overriding certain methods. So to get a better idea on this, and we'll show you this in a second, um, you really want to read what the init is on each of these build steps. Mm -hmm. We're definitely going to go through this. Args that are used by your custom build step are passed in as argdict. Args that are passed on to whatever that subclass is are passed in as ki uh, keyword arguments. We do this to keep things separate. We're going to take a look at this now. This is uh, the hello world um, build step. It doesn't do anything other than echo hello world with whatever you pass it into it. Um, in theory, what you could also do is have a custom property on that build page, on that force build page, it says enter your first name, enter your last name, and have it passed into this custom build set. One of the reasons why, if you look, and let me actually get into this because I believe I have it in my slide. Oh, there, look. One of the reasons that we have this is that this is the one thing we require. Everyone, when you override in, Override it with that as a start. Pass itself, pass the build factory, pass your art dictionary, and if you need to, pass a keyword arguments. The reason we do that is because custom build steps are dynamically loaded. You write your custom build step, you drop it into your build step directory, you reference it within your configuration file, it gets loaded automatically. You don't need to hack any actual auto builder code itself. Unless you do something weird or stupid. And one of the examples of this is check out layers, which I wrote. Uh, you get to determine whether I did something weird or stupid. Um, check out layers is a single step. <coughs> Checkout layers is a single step. But what it does is it creates multiple build steps. So for each repo within repos, it'll check out that layer.
So like I showed earlier, there's this mix and match repo concept that I needed to implement. Uh, trigger builds needed to have the same branch and tag in the repo as the build set that triggered it. Uh, we actually, the Octo project sees this a lot. So we have people who maintain different layers. If I want to build 1.4 M4 branch, <coughs> I need to contact all those people who maintain those la layers and say, hey, yes, create a 1.4 M4 branch for me. Um, this would start, as more and more people are maintaining different layers and I'm building more and more of those layers, this basically put me in the position where I dictate other people's branching policy, which I wanted, I wanted to get out of that business and in general, it's just kind of icky. Some more features that got added are, and I showed you this early, triggered build sets will actually inherit the property and repo of what it triggers and render that on that force build page. There's also some more config options within the auto, uh, autobuilder.conf file, uh, specifically uh, BB number threads and uh, parallel make. Before that was just hard coded, now it's, you can actually override what that is. <coughs> and like you saw in this, there's some UI changes. If you've seen the Octo Auto Builder and, and if you've seen uh, Bare Bones BuildBot, um, this little bit of very ugly um, jQuery actually makes it so that you don't have to scroll through five pages worth of properties. So this is one of the things that was requested during the first uh, showing of this publicly. I showed one of my coworkers this and uh, he's sitting right there and he's like, I don't want to see five pages of properties. Some of the other features that added, uh, we've upgraded BuildBot. Um, the Octo Auto Builder was initially on BuildBot 0.8.4 patch level one. We're now on 0.8.7 patch level one. Uh, we've also upgraded a few dependencies. So when you check out the entire uh, Yocto Auto Builder Git repo, the only thing that you need on your actual host machine is Python. All the other libraries come down with it. So now I have a system that produces a quarter terabyte worth of data, not including all the other stuff it produces. It runs on a cluster of 10 high class, high-end server machines. Um, and Dave's not going to give me $100,000 to replicate all that infrastructure. So does, it, does it, anyone feel my pain here? On how, how, how do I test this? Um, remember that code compile test. Well, my compo co code compile test loop is six and a half hours. If I'm doing it on a single machine, let's assume I have all that space, uh, I'm looking at about 42 hours worth of code compile test loop. So this is kind of the answer. Um, we're going to be doing this in production. It's not as scary as it seems. So next week, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing side-by-side -side installs. We'll be using different ports. So we'll have two Yocto Auto Builders running. Um, we're going to do the new refactor builds late night when no one else is awake, hopefully. Or at least no one else is awake with utilization of the Yocto Auto Builder. And then it, what we're going to do, what I'll be doing during the day is verifying No, wait, no, I, I, don't give me grief. Um, it, it, I'm not, I'm not going to be sleeping is the answer. Um, yeah. <coughs> so we're going to be doing side-by-side -side installs. This may actually slow down some of the stuff that's going on on the main auto builder, but we're going to keep everything jailed out. And then once we get 
through our milestone five period and everything's copacetic, hopefully. And everything agrees what the main auto builder has produced is, agrees with what the new software produces. We're going to switch over to the new stuff. Now, and, and this may make my manager cringe, I want this out for 1.4. I want this to produce the 1.4 release. I'm not going to push it so that it jeopardizes the 1.4 release. 1.4 release is way more important than auto builder code. So like every half-baked, uh, not quite finished code project, uh, there's a to-do list. Um, and I am more than happy, hopefully, for people who, if they want to uh, start working on this with me, uh, especially if you're a release engineer and that's one of your passions, to start helping with this. Um, there's a few bits of re-implementation details that need to go through. Uh, Persist DB, uh, generally we maintain that between builds. Uh, ADT installer, we generate two ADT installers, a QA ADT installer and the regular ADT installer. And build history tracking we need to re-implement as well. Uh, we're still missing a few build, main, few build sets, mainly uh, some meta intel machines are missing, OE core is missing. Um, we have documentation. Believe it or not, I actually sat down and wrote documentation. I know, this is amazing. A software developer who wrote documentation. It's crazy. Um, but I did write documentation. Um, it could definitely use some help. Um, it could definitely use, you know, maybe about twice the size it is and a little bit more in detail. Uh, and I also need people to test like Matt. Um, like I said, I can't tell whether it works just on my config, or if it, I can tell whether it works on my configuration, I can't tell whether it doesn't work on yours. I have no idea. Um, there's some more features that need to be added. One of those is killing build triggers. There's this annoying little bug that's been there for, I guess, the past year and a half, and I haven't had time to fix it, that if you trigger a build, it spits out all the other builds and says, start building them, and then you want to kill stuff. Well, you can kill all those triggered builds, but that one build just sits there and waits, and it waits, and it will not allow you to do anything until it either times out or you restart the server. And by server, not the actual hardware, but the BuildBot server. Uh, I'm sure this is about 10 lines of code. I just haven't had time to look at it. There's also a really cool new feature, and if you uh, follow the OctoList p-test integration, um, I talked about this in the Octo Developer Day. Um, there's a lot of packages where you do make, configure, make, make install, make test. Um, there's been some work to strip out those make tests. <coughs> and be able, and so there's still some work that needs to occur here, but be able to run them in QEMU on the actual auto builders. I know there's been a lot of people talking about board farms. Um, one of the things that I would like to see happen is, especially if you do have a board farm, start working on custom build steps to take the end results of these builds and spit them out to your board farm and maybe spit back tests. And also, if you have other use cases. Um, like I said, I'm trying to make this so that it's very user-driven. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that there aren't very many embedded release engineers. Um, so this should be something that, if you're running a small shop, start using it. If it's not meeting your use case, let me know. Um, and there is some upstream work that I need to do for one single patch about this build order thing, which is, I'm not the only one who's complained about it. So live demo, and I've kind of actually done live demo throughout this, but I'm gonna show this a little bit more. So let's say, hey Saul, do you have a mutt ready? Uh, what is it, SGW mutt? Hmm? Stage master under test. Is that a valid uh, branch? 
Yeah, I don't remember. All right, you check for me. So I want to build master under test, which when we say master under test, one of our processes is uh, when a patch comes into the auto uh, mailing list, Saul over here grabs that patch and starts trying to test whether that patch is going to blow master all the hell. Are they underscores? Uh, if the patch is good, and he'll run master under test, we call it MUT. Um, if the patch is good and it passes the auto builder, then he sends a consolidated pull request to Richard. And Richard will end up pulling that up into master. So the wireless here is probably not going to be very happy with me, but let's hope. So now we have nightly master under test, but we have all these other build sets here that don't know about it. Now we have to set all the triggered builds to the same repo branch combo. We just did that by hitting that button up top. So they all know that we're going to run uh, Pocky Contrib Stage Master under test. Let's say nightly non-GPL. I actually don't want to do that. I want to run Pocky and I want to run it with master. And I want to do that with lower case. And, oh, build appliance. Build appliance. I don't want it to auto rev. I actually want it to default to what's currently in the recipe. So what I'm doing is I'm passing this property that is really in the build appliance config file, but I'm inheriting it all the way up from nightly. And then I force build on this, and hopefully nothing falls down. Um, so this will take a minute to update. Uh, what it'll end up doing is it'll update all the repos because it nightly needs to do its own checkout. And then it'll run a preamble, create an autoconf, create a BB layers comp. And then what it does is it hits this target called build images. The reason I do this is because I have a shared DLDR. Nightly goes and just does a universe <coughs> fetch. That way all the other builders don't actually need network. So what this ends up doing is it ends up saving some time because the builders just go and they look in DLDR and they say, oh, okay, I got the most recent. I don't have to touch this. And then once it does that, it will start triggering all these builders. One important thing here that I want to show is build appliance has a property. It's called wait for finish. Build appliance can take a long time. Um, I don't need to wait for build appliance to finish in order to finish up nightly. So <coughs> I've set wait for finish to be false. And this ends up going into the um, the, 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 the create uh, images and says, oh, no, we don't need to do that, or build images. And this says, yeah, we don't want to trigger this, or we don't want to wait for this. So that's what I have. I'm sorry if uh, Ross wasn't here, um, but any questions? <coughs>